karma. When someone becomes a parent, there's a great joy in the experience. Baby giggles, baby coos, and the sweet smell of their skin when you kiss them goodnight. Parenting can be so rewarding. But it can also be stressful. It comes with a whole set of endless worries. Some are legitimate, and some are just those obsessive, nagging, irrational ones that like to gnaw away at your brain while you're trying to sleep at night. It's your job to keep this tiny person safe as they grow. You try and do your best, but you're often left wondering how well you're really doing. The news can be a terrible thing when you're a parent. School shootings, kidnappings, missing children, murders. Your heart drops for the parents of these children. Maybe you feel their pain, but maybe you've also judged them unfairly and deep down you know that, but you're just trying to find sense in a senseless crime. You want to blame someone, but often the wrong people are blamed. You wonder if something like that could happen to your own child, no matter how safe you think you all are. No matter what precautions you've taken, no matter how many talks you've given about safety. So many bad things happen in this world. And a lot of them do happen to children. Missing and never heard from again, like Natalie Holloway or little Madeline McCann. Rescued after many months or many years, in some cases, like Elizabeth Smart and J.C. Dugard. Or abducted and murdered, like Adam Walsh and Amber Hagerman, the former whose death resulted in the Amber Alert system in the U.S., the system that alerts cell phones when there's a possible abduction in the area, getting the news out to as many people as quickly as possible. Ricky Thompson was six years old. He was walking to the bus stop down the street with the same group of kids he did every single day. He tripped over his shoelaces and his lunchbox went flying. He rubbed his knee and looked at the other kids who were still walking. They hadn't even noticed that he'd fallen and for whatever reason, he didn't call to them and say, hey, wait up. He stood up and brushed his pants off and walked over to his lunchbox. It had partially come unzipped, so he pushed the contents all the way back inside and zipped it up. He noticed the other kids had already rounded the corner, so he'd need to run to catch up to them or he'd miss the bus. His mother would be furious if he missed the bus. She had driven him every day up until a month ago when she finally agreed to let him walk with these slightly older kids 
as long as he kept up with them, didn't talk to any strangers, and did not miss the bus. He had almost reached the corner when he felt someone grab him and whip him around to face them. His backpack and lunchbox went flying as he came face to face with a man with jet black hair and piercing blue eyes. A man in his 20s named Cecil Bowden. Ricky opened his mouth to protest and immediately had a cloth shoved over his nose. He felt dizzy. The last thing he'd see was Cecil's face as he carried him to his car. No one witnessed the incident. About 20 minutes later, a woman walking her dog found Ricky's backpack and lunchbox. The bus driver noticed Ricky wasn't with the other children, and they alerted him to the fact that he had been walking with them, but disappeared. The driver immediately contacted the school and they contacted Ricky's mother and the police. It all happened fairly quickly, but it was too late. Ricky's body was found two days later, deep in the woods, about five miles away. Cecil lived with his uncle. His uncle, who saw it on the news, said it was too bad about the boy, not realizing Cecil could possibly have anything to do with the murder. Cecil was numb to it, acted like it hadn't even happened. However, like the police suspected the killer might do, he found himself peeping at Ricky's burial. He watched from behind a tree. Ricky's mother was shaking uncontrollably as her husband held her up. When Cecil had had his fill, he turned from the tree and began to walk away. Someone tugged at his pants leg. He turned around and there stood Ricky watching his burial as well. He pointed to his small coffin being lowered into the ground. I don't like the dark. Why did you do this? Cecil couldn't believe his eyes. He began to run. He ran until he reached the edge of the graveyard. He stopped short when he suddenly found Ricky standing in front of him again. You won't get away with your life, he said. Then Cecil felt a tapping on his shoulder. He turned around and found himself face to face with Ricky. He did a double take and turned back around to where Ricky had just been standing in front of him. He was no longer there only behind him now. You won't, you know, he repeated. Cecil shook with fear and ran towards the woods as fast as he could. To reach the woods, he would have to cross the road. He ran, looking backwards a lot of the time afraid Ricky's ghost would follow him. He wasn't paying attention to the road as he found himself in the middle of it and right smack into the path of a semi that had laid on its horn but couldn't stop. 
Cecil didn't get away with his life. Ricky stared blankly at the gruesome scene. Suddenly, police officers and people attending the funeral had run up to see what was going on. Not his parents, though. They knelt near his grave and wept. He walked slowly towards them, feeling himself being pulled upwards, but he was determined to say goodbye. He pushed with his entire soul and made it to his mother and father. He hugged his mother with all of the love and strength that he had. He took his father's hand and kissed it lovingly. Both of his parents looked at each other as if they had felt something and embraced. Ricky mouthed the words, I love you, goodbye and was pulled upwards towards the heavens.